Democritus, minus 460 to minus 360 BC. The world is a scene, life is a passage. You came, you saw, you left. The world is a theater, life is a drama, you come, you see, you leave. Democritus was born in Abdera, Thrace, around 460 BC, to a family of aristocratic origin. Abdera was the third richest city in the Athenian League, paying a tax of 15 talents and owing its wealth to its abundant grain production and to the fact that it was a port for conducting trade with the interior of Thrace. From his youth Democritus showed his inclination towards the study and research of nature. With the money of his father's inheritance he traveled throughout the known world, Egypt, Persia, Babylon, possibly Ethiopia and India. As he says, I, therefore, have wandered in more parts of the earth than men of my time, exploring the most distant places, and have known too many countries and climates and heard too many learned men but in the composition of schemes accompanied by proof no one has as yet surpassed me. I lived a total of eight years in a foreign country. During these wanderings, he became intimately acquainted with the philosophy of Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes and Heraclitus. In Miletus, he may have met for the first time the man who was to mark his life, Lysippus. From him he must have learned the philosophy of Parmenides, Empedocles and Pythagoras. In fact, Democritus would later write a special treatise on the latter. When Democritus once returned to Abdera, he had now spent his entire share of his father's inheritance. His brother Damasus took over his care and maintenance. In Abdera, Democritus devoted himself to teaching and writing his works. He was one of the first to believe that matter is composed of indivisible, invisible elements, the atoms, that the Milky Way is light from distant stars, that the universe has other worlds and even some inhabited ones. Democritus' interests were extremely broad. He was concerned with almost all areas of human knowledge. Very few extracts have survived from his vast body of writings. It seems that the esteem in which Democritus was held by his compatriots caused the envy of some of them, who thought of calling for the activation of a traditional law, which provided for the prohibition of burial at home of anyone who had squandered his father's property. Democritus responded by reading his great decoration, arguing that not only did he not squander the paternal property, but he multiplied it by creating a valuable philosophical work. He was named Laughing Man, perhaps because he preached that cheerfulness is the goal for every man's life. He died at a very advanced age, since he was ranked among the longest living Greek thinkers, various sources deliver that he lived from 90 to 109 years. We do not know the exact date of his death, which is conventionally placed at 370 or 360 BC. And there are various legends about the end of the philosopher. According to one of them, he wanted to commit suicide in old age by abstaining from food. But because it was the days of the Thesmophoria and the women of the family wanted to celebrate them, they begged him to postpone his death for a few days. He then ordered a vessel of honey, or warm bread in another version, to be brought near him, and he lived, until the festivals were over, with only the smell of honey. When the days passed, he surrendered to death. About peace of mind. Because peace of mind is brought to people by restrained fun and a life of harmony. Deprivation and superabundance tend to turn into their opposite and cause great movements in the soul, and souls that move to a great extent are neither stable nor serene. One must therefore keep one's mind on things that correspond to one's powers, and be content with what one has. He should not pay much attention to the things that are envied or admired by many and should not think about them constantly. He should look at how the poor live and feel how much they suffer. In this way, the things that are near him and available to him may well seem great and enviable, his soul will no longer suffer in wanting more. For he who admires men who have riches and are blessed by others, he who is continually indulging in his memories, is forced to always devise something new and is driven by his desire to irreparable and unlawful acts. This is precisely why one should not seek for things that are far away from him, but rather be satisfied with what is near him, 
comparing his life with the lives of those who are worse off. Bearing in mind how much they suffer, he should bless himself for how much better he himself lives. For if you keep this well in mind, you will live more peacefully and prevent. Not a few evils in your life envy, jealousy and malice. There are two forms of knowledge, one genuine, the other dark. And to the dark belongs all that follows, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch. The other, the genuine one, is separate from it. When the dark form can no longer see anything else infinitesimally, nor hear, nor smell, nor taste, nor perceive by touch, but must seek something more subtle, then comes the genuine form of knowledge, since it has an instrument to think more subtly. Democritus, Example 11, from a schoolbook. How we came to the concept of God. As the ancients saw, the events occurring in the theater of heaven, thunder, lightning, thunderbolts, the conjunctions of the stars, and the eclipses of the sun and moon, their terror made them hold the gods responsible. Excerpt from the Phronesis. Pleasure and the absence of pleasure are the criteria of the beneficial and the non-beneficial. Accept the absence of pleasure only if it is beneficial. Restraint multiplies pleasures and increases pleasure. If one exceeds the required measure, the most pleasant things become the most unpleasant. A brave man is not only he who defeats the enemy, but also he who is stronger than pleasures. Some men are oppressors of cities, but subservient to women. Untimely pleasures cause discontent. Thales the Thmilesian. The Thales astronomer. The first to accept the sphericity of the Earth. He measured the length of the year, 365 days. Calculated the ratio of the Sun's diameter and the diameter of the Moon to the orbit to its orbit around the Earth, and found them to be one division, 720. The Thales mathematician. He introduced the concept of parallel lines. He introduced the concept of angles and their first theorems. He discovered criteria of equality and similarity of triangles. Calculated the height of the pyramids with similar triangles, c. 565 BC. The Thales Physicist Thales hypothesized that the prime element, the principle and base of and the beginning and beginning of the world, must be one of the four basic elements and concluded that this element the essential component of all things is water. By observing that electrum, amber, when rubbed on woolen clothing, acquires the property of attracting hairs of small feathers etc. Thales laid the foundations of electricity. Several centuries later, Thales, who was the creator of the electric lightning. Electricity generation using friction was realized by the with the help of electrostatic machines. Thales is also responsible for the invention of the electrostatic charge with the use of electric motors. The discovery of magnetism. Thales topographer and the verb compodio compute. Because of these nodes of Thales, the word combio was created which meaning to calculate precisely. The word combio after a journey thousands of years, and after passing through Latins, Romans, Anglo-Saxons, it came to us today as compute and computer. Calculating the height of the pyramids. 2000 years the pyramid of Cheops has been there and no one has been able which piqued Thales' interest. Omicron who measured it using a stick, which he supported vertically on the ground next to the pyramids. He then waited until the length of the shadow of the stick was equal to its height. When this happened, he measured the length of the pyramid's shadow. Apparently, at the moment when the length of the wooden stick's shadow became equal its height, then all the objects, 
that were vertically positioned on the ground, formed a shadow, with a length equal to their height. The pyramids were no exception and so the height could be adjusted to the height of the pyramid, measured by the length of their shadow. Thales therefore used the properties of equal triangles to find the height of 276.75 cubits, or 145.3 meters.